Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. LSO. Go. Weather. Go. Pointing. Pointing. Go. CDH. Go. GNC. Go. Ecom. Go. Inco. Go. NGC. Go. Agent start box. Go. Rock removal. Range status. Range green. Upper stage LH2 secure at flight level. Status check. Go Delta. Go Ryan. Five, four, four, three, three, two, one, one, one. And liftoff at dawn. The dawn of Orion and a new era of American space exploration. Through Apogee, the altitude was 3,132 nautical miles. So let's talk about Orion. So Orion's made up of three major pieces. Uh, the first being the launch abort system. Uh, the launch abort system was tested back in 2010 on our pad abort test down at White Sands, New Mexico. Um, and this, this portion of our vehicle is designed to take the crew away from a very bad day on the rocket. So during ascent, if we have a, a vehicle that is not behaving, as we call in the industry, nominally, we can punch the launch abort system and takes the crew module away at about 12 to 15 Gs and gets them safely away from an exploding rocket. It is comprised of three solid motors. The first one being the abort motor produces 500,000 pounds of thrust to carry that crew module away. Um, so that, that puts the crew module at around 21,000 pounds, roughly. Uh, and uh, so that, that motor is designed to pull that away from a, a chasing, exploding launch vehicle. Uh, it then has new technology. Uh, all three motors of this launch abort system are solid rocket motors. So the uh, attitude control motor up here at the top guides the launch abort system in the abort case so that we can steer it the way we want to. And it has eight nozzles up at the top. And so those eight nozzles are basically controlling an explosion occurring as that solid motor lights up. <clears throat> and we can direct the thrust out of any one of those nozzles or all eight or any combination thereof uh, at any time. And then the third motor is the jettison motor here in between. And that pulls this 15 to 17,000 pound launch abort system away from the crew module so that then the crew module can then land safely under its parachutes. The crew module is exactly that. It's where the crew is. 
Uh, we can carry a crew of up to four into deep space. It is advanced systems, all redundant, and can check the health and safety of the entire vehicle without any input from the ground controllers or the astronauts themselves. So basically, it is a supercomputer flying in space. <clears throat> Finally, the service module, um, which for EFT-1 was basically the primary structure. We didn't need the service module and the propulsion system uh, for this flight test. But uh, that is currently being developed by the European Space Agency. Um, and that will give us the propulsion and the, and the, the extra commodities needed, water and oxygen, to keep the crew alive for extended periods of time in deep space. And, uh, and so that's, we'll be flying for the first time on EM-1. Now my job in all of this is to take this vehicle and integrate it with the launch vehicle. So for EFT-1, for Exploration Flight Test 1, I was working with ULA uh, to make sure that the technical integration got done, that we weren't breaking their vehicle and they weren't breaking our vehicle from liftoff through spacecraft separation and, uh, and work through all the technical details and the schedule of exchanging data between the two companies uh, to make sure that we had a very successful flight. <clears throat> so the timeline for our exploration missions so I mentioned Pad Abort 1 was our test that we did back in 2010 out of White Sands, New Mexico, where we tested the launch abort system. And then we had EFT-1 that just flew in December of 2014. And that was uh, to test several subsystems and some of our major risks on the program. And uh, it was a very, very successful day. Uh, we launched on December 5th at 7.05. Uh, Eastern time from Cape Canaveral and landed in the South Pacific about 630 miles south, southwest of San Diego uh, in, in the Pacific Ocean uh, four and a half hours later roughly. And I'll talk about these EM-1 and AA-2 EM-2 missions a little bit later in the presentation. So as I mentioned, Exploration Flight Test 1. This is a cartoon. So we launched out of Space Launch Complex 37B. Uh, right next to that pad is the Saturn I pad, and some of those artifacts of Saturn I still exist there. And I had a unique opportunity um, once when I was down there to go take a pad tour of all the old pads there. And uh, there's a beautiful view of the thrust bucket looking at pad 30, 37B that I plan to frame with the, the whole stack sitting on the launch pad framed by those Saturn I thrust buckets. Um, just an absolutely... Beautiful, uh, beautiful view. <clears throat> so we do, we launched out of uh, Cape Canaveral that morning on December 5th, and the first stage takes us up and gets us almost to orbit, and then we fire up the second stage, and then that's when we do the fairing separation. The fairings are designed to protect the service module during the ascent heating. As you fly through the atmosphere, uh, you tend to heat up quite a bit. Well, in our future missions, we will have radiators and solar rays that need to be protected by those, those fairings. But for this mission, they were there so that we could test out that subsystem, make sure that when those uh, pyro events happen and the mechanisms worked, uh, that, that all worked out uh, perfectly. So shortly after we separate the fairings and we make sure that the vehicle is stable, we then jettison the launch abort system because it's no longer needed and that falls back into the ocean. <clears throat> so we do one loop around the, around the Earth, and then we fire up the engines again, and that's when the upper stage of the Delta IV then took Orion to 3,600 miles above the Earth's surface, which is 15 times higher than the International Space Station, taking us through the Van Allen belts, not only out of the Van Allen belts, but back into the Van Allen belts, which is a high radiation place uh, that our astronauts and our electronic components will see. And so we tested all of that out, our radiation protection of the vehicle flying through the Van Allen belts. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we're going up 3,600 nautical, or 3,600 miles up into space, all to build up speed, because we wanted to get up to 20,000 miles per hour on reentry, which is about 85% of the velocity from a lunar return. And that, that was all meant to test out the biggest heat shield, single piece heat shield ever built for a spacecraft, a single piece heat shield. Not, 
single piece heat shield. Not the tiles of the space shuttle, right? This shuttle had a huge tile uh, system to protect it, but the heat shield on the bottom of Orion is the largest one piece heat shield ever built for a spacecraft. <clears throat> and so, two, four and a half hours later, 20,000 miles per hour, altitude 3,600 feet, we got a ton of data. Uh, and uh, we just submitted our final report to NASA last Thursday. We have probably over a terabyte to two terabytes of data, instrumental data, and video and pictures that, that we have gone through and reviewed. And I've got to say, the engineering review board last week was one of the smoothest I've ever seen because everything came in just as we expected. And, uh, it was, it was quite an amazing achievement by everybody involved uh, in this mission. So this was a picture actually the night before on December 3rd, because uh, December 4th was our original launch, uh, uh, launch attempt, but we got scrubbed that day for multiple reasons. We had a boat sitting in the range, and the range told us we couldn't go until the boat cleared. And then we, we were getting ready to launch again. We got down to the final seconds, and the computer stopped the, the, aborted the mission because we had two large winds blowing on the vehicle. Uh, and that happened twice. And so that delayed us again. We re reset the clocks, get everything ready to run again, get ready to launch. And now, we're, now we run into a technical problem. Now we've got valves that won't close on the Delta IV Heavy. And so, I'm sitting on the causeway with my family watching this launch because I, I wanted to be with my family. This was their first launch to see, and uh, I thought that was something special for them to see this historic mission go off. And uh, I'm intensely listening because they had, out on the causeway, they've got speaker systems set up so you can hear what's going on. You don't hear everything, but you, you hear a few things, and I'm intensely listening to what's going on. Why, why are we holding? And, and everybody's asking me questions. Why, 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 why? And, and uh, so it was st some stuck valves, right? Hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, and liquid oxygen are really cold. And those valves had started to freeze up because of the long period that uh, we were sitting on the pad. And so they were cycling those valves, making them chatter, basically trying to break that ice off so they could get them closed. Well, we then started to reach the end of our launch window, and so we had to scrub for the day, which meant my kids had to get up again at 2 o'clock the next morning. <laughs> And I, I got to say, this was the funniest story. At the end of the day, when, we, when they finally said we're scrubbing, my oldest kid and I think my youngest kid looked at me and they're like, Dad, Lockheed Martin and ULA are not on Team Disney. Because <laughs> I promised them they'd come to the launch and we got to get up really early to get on buses, to go out to the causeway, to watch the launch. And I said that. For that, you know, afterwards, when we finally get off the ground, we're going to go to Disney. So, so thankfully, on the 5th of December, that morning, 7.05, we launched right at the beginning of the window with no issues and had a very successful four and a half hour trip around the Earth, a couple of trips around the Earth, uh, and landed in the South Pacific Ocean. And in fact, we were following the whole mission the entire time from my phone as we drove over to Orlando <laughs> and pulled into Hollywood Studios parking lot just as we splashed down and said, all right, we're good to go. So for those that have never experienced the launch, that morning we're sitting on the causeway, which is about three and a half to four miles away from the launch pad. We had to get special permission from the FAA to have 20,000 people out on the causeway because you're you know, the, the risk associated with having that many people close to a launch pad, you know, drives up the casual, casualty ratings when you're looking at insurance policies. And, and so we had to get special permission to have that many people out on the causeway. And, and so we were, like I said, three and a half, four miles away. So you see this big bright light of the engines firing up, but you really don't hear it until seconds later when that acoustic wave you know, travels that distance and then starts hitting you in the chest. Um, and it's quite amazing to feel the power of a launch. And uh, the Delta IV Heavy is currently the only vehicle that was capable of flying this mission uh, in the U.S. inventory. And, uh, and so that's why we chose to fly on a Delta IV Heavy. 
Uh, so here is a picture close up of the Orion. And so we're testing out several of our systems. Uh, so here we have our T0 connections uh, connected to the vehicle. And uh, those will pull away as we lift off. And, uh, and so we'll, let's just watch that video if I can get it to play. So the, the steam you see coming out of there, that is the R134 cooling uh, lines that we pipe into the vehicle to help keep all those electronics cooled down while we're sitting on the pad uh, powered up. So again, ULA Delta IV Heavy produces about 1.8 million pounds of thrust. And the feel of that is quite amazing. So if you ever get a chance to go down and watch a launch, I highly recommend you get as close as possible. Uh, and in fact, last night, well, yesterday, I'm on the plane, and I'm on the airplane's Wi-Fi. And, uh, and I see that Chris Reynolds, a current student at Michigan, and his MFly team are traveling down to Florida for MFly competition this weekend. And he posed that, you know, they're in South Carolina, and they're seeing the 787 Dreamliner, and tonight they're going to be at the Cape to watch the Atlas launch. I'm like, Chris, had you told me two weeks ago, I would have got you on site, and you would have been up close. Uh, but they did. They got to see a launch last night, uh, and evening launches are pretty spectacular because they light up the night sky. Um, and so they got to see the Atlas launch last night uh, from Cape Canaveral. So. Uh, this next set of video, that's our service fairing, uh, service module fairings uh, deploying. And again, those will fall back into the atmosphere uh, and burn up or, or land in the Indian Ocean. Or uh, I guess it was in the Atlantic Ocean at that point. <clears throat> and then this is the launch abort system pulling away from the front of the vehicle. And we actually light up the jettison motor before we release the, the vehicle. So. We light up those jettison motors, so there's a little bit of tug on the upper stage, and we noticed that in the acceleration data that we saw. And then the, the separation, the release, and retention mechanisms are then released for the thing to fly away. And again, that jettison motor produces a thrust of about 17,000 pounds of thrust, 17 to 20,000 pounds of thrust. This is probably the most spectacular video that we on Orion absolutely love. This is a re-entry from looking out the docking tunnel uh, of the crew module. So you see the plasma start to form around the vehicle as we start to hit the Earth's atmosphere. Also, our engineers overlaid some technical data for folks that are technical, of the technical mind. So over here, you have the altitude of the vehicle as it comes down. On the bottom left, you have the Latin longitude uh, showing you where you are in relation to the to the Earth, and so you can see the outline of the Baja California, Southern California, and Mexico. Over on the top right, you see the acceleration, or in this case, the deceleration, slowing down from 20,000 miles per hour to about 300 miles per hour just by hitting the density of our atmosphere. And so we reached a good eight Gs on that deceleration as we're coming back in into the Earth's atmosphere. And then the bottom right shows the bank angle. So our control system is guiding the vehicle uh, and guiding the bank angle to make sure that we're shedding that speed appropriately and we're shedding the heat appropriately too. So there's multiple t bank angles that they do throughout the flight uh, to help shed that speed and the heat associated with re-entry. So this video is, is running at three times speed. So it's going a little faster. You'll see little poofs of smoke coming out. Those are our reaction control thrusters firing to make sure that our vehicle is heading in the right attitude uh, that we want it to be in for the right lift and drag that we want the vehicle to be in so we slow down. So you'll see those fire by every once in a while. Now we're coming up on the forward bay cover jettison. You'll see two parachutes come out and then the forward bay jettison fly away. And that cover protects the front end of the vehicle where all of our main parachutes are while it's in space. But we have to get that cover off in order to get the mains out. And so those, that, that two, first two parachutes took out the, uh, the four bay cover and pulled it away. And then these drogue chutes slow us down a little bit more so that we can pull the mains out. And we have three chutes pull the mains out. And then they're slowly unfurled so that we don't rip or tear the parachutes 
from the forces of slowing us down to about 20 to 30 miles per hour uh, so we can have that nice soft landing in the ocean. These parachutes can cover an entire football field. <clears throat> so we'll come in, uh, you'll see we'll pass through again, this is at three times speed, so we'll come through the cloud deck and then shortly after that there's a little jolt at the bottom here where when we finally hit the ocean floor and have a splashdown. Um, while before we went under parachutes, our guidance system uh, error was less than, or le yeah, less than 0.6 miles away from our targeted destination. And then when we went under parachutes, the wind sort of drifted us a little bit, and we came in within one and a half miles of our targeted location, which is well within the five mile radius bullseye that we had set and the 10 mile additional bullseye that we had. So we, we called it a bullseye landing for the most part um, and was uh, quite the day. So there's the splash down. You see the water sitting now on top of the docking tunnel splash around. Um, everybody loves this video. <laughs> and if you go out on YouTube, there's a similar video of Apollo uh, as well. So this is the, the view from the, the helicopters and the, and the ship that, that was out there. And the US Navy, uh, the US Anchorage, uh, was out there to collect our piece of space flight hardware. And sitting inside this vehicle was the flag that I had flown. Uh, so they drag it back into the, anchor, the USS Anchorage. Um, this is a well deck ship. So they, they can open up the back of the ship and basically flood the ship so that we can pull the vehicle into the vehicle into the into the ship and then drain the water and put it down on its on its sta stanches. <clears throat> All right, so like I said, tested out, you know, 13 of the 17 exploration mission risks, our top risks by doing this test flight um, allowed our engineers to correlate their predictions to actual flight data so that we can then optimize and modify the design as needed from the data we've collected and, and create a better spacecraft for our astronauts in the future. Uh, so we had 17 separation events occur um, that started after we got on to second stage burn uh, six minutes into launch. Uh, we tested the heat shield. That heat shield is 1.6 inches thick. Uh, we laser scanned it before we launched. We laser scanned it after we got it back to make sure that we understood how much of that material actually burned away on reentry so that we can better predict our, have better model predictions in the future. Uh, we also tested the radiation uh, in the vehicle. We had th three different radiation experiments, including one developed by students. Um, and we had a big competition, I think it was open to worldwide, US wide and students submitted their radiation experiments and we selected a, a, a group. I can't remember exactly where that was. I should have looked that up before I came. But uh, they flew their experiment on board and have gotten their data back now. And, and we also flew two other experiments testing that radiation since we were flying through the Van Allen belts. And all those, again, all those electronics on board the vehicle have to be radiation hardened so they don't get upset and you have you know, your computer restarting on you, your, in Microsoft terms, the blue screen of death. <coughs> Failure is not an option in space. You can't have the blue screen of death. So all of our hardware and our software have to work flawlessly. And when they do have hiccups, they got to be able to restart and, and uh, function again when they come back up. Uh, so again, then our parachutes, again, slowed us down from 20,000 miles per hour down to 20 miles per hour in the matter, matter of minutes. So we had 11 parachutes, um, eight for the crew module itself, uh, and then uh, deployment of those chutes started around 300 miles per hour. The main chutes get pulled out at about 10,000 feet above, uh, above the ocean. So, <clears throat> All right, so what's next? EM-1 is next, and EM-1 is our exploration mission one. And we are currently building hardware, and we are on our way to a critical design review this fall so that we can finish up the design and assembly of that vehicle uh, to fly, hopefully, in 2018. 
And that mission will be an unmanned mission with a European service module attached to us. And it will take us out to a, a distant retrograde orbit around the moon. And then after that, we plan to fly AA2, this little tiny rocket down here. Uh, and that's to test out the abort system in a flight configuration or in flight environment. So we're going to take it up to a very high dynamic environment, high pressure with while we're still in the atmosphere, high angle of attack, and then abort off of that rocket so that we can then make sure we can control the launch abort system from those high dynamic environments of an ascent uh, profile. <clears throat> and then we do that all in preparation for EM2, which will be our first crewed mission. Uh, again, another distant retrograde orbit around the moon. And we're all looking forward to the day that we finally return our astronauts to space and uh, certainly on a, an adventure out past low Earth orbit where we've been for the last 20, 30 years and go back into deep space exploring. And that's, I tell you, most of the people that I work with on Orion have that same dream, that same vision that we want to take humans further than we've ever gone before, and that's our plan. So I mentioned hardware is already being built. Um, quite honestly, you know, I, being from Alpena, a small town, I was like, well, I'm probably one of the very few people that are in this industry to begin with. But I have a high school friend, actually, who works for a major tooling and machine down in Indianapolis who does all this machining for our hardware, uh, Jason Pardike, and he, built, he helps send us the hardware so we can assemble the primary structure down in, in New Orleans. Um, and so it's a real, real honor to see how far you know, this space industry actually stretches into other people's lives and affects uh, other people as well. So that hardware is getting built now. Most of it's Pathfinder right now as we head into the final designs of our exploration mission. And uh, most everybody now that we've submitted our final report to NASA last week, most people have now transitioned and are working this solely, our, our next mission, Exploration Mission 1, <clears throat> including myself, wrapping up a few things with ULA. But um, I, my mission has now changed over, and I'm doing most of my integration work with the folks at NASA Marshall who are building the SLS launch vehicle. <clears throat> So I mentioned uh, the European service module. Uh, so Lockheed Martin was originally building this service module, but in the, in, in the same mindset of the International Space Station, uh, NASA wanted to continue that collaboration effort with our international partners. And so uh, they've now moved the service module uh, build to the European Space Agency. So Lockheed Martin's now in charge of integrating the European service module with our vehicle. And so we're working with Airbus and, and folks over in Germany and Italy and, and France uh, to have that make sure it meets all the requirements that we've got set for the rest of the vehicle and that it all comes together nicely in the end. Let me start by quoting Fielding Yost as to why I flew a Michigan flag on board EFT-1. This is a quote from Fielding Yost. Let me reiterate the spirit of Michigan. It's based upon a deathless loyalty to Michigan and all her ways. An enthusiasm that makes it second nature for Michigan men at the time when he wrote it, PC men and women, to spread the gospel of their university to the world's distant outposts and a conviction that nowhere is there a better university in any way than this Michigan of ours. So giving back to the university is something that I've done since I left here. I call it the three T's, time, talent, and treasure. So, so far, I've given a lot of my time and my talent <laughs> back to the university. Like I said, I left here in December 95, started working at Lockheed Martin in January 96, and I automatically almost day two, got involved with the alumni club out in Denver, eventually ran the alumni club out in Denver. I then moved to Cleveland, Ohio for a few years, worked for a small company. And while I was in Cleveland, 
I was asked to join the College of Engineering Alumni Board, and I stayed on the College of Engineering Alumni Board for a few years, uh, eventually being the chair of that board um, in the last two years of my tenure on the board. I was a part of the Dean's Ad Industry Advisory Board at that time when I was the chair. Um, then I moved back to Colorado to specifically work at Ryan because that had been my dream job to work human space flight since, like I mentioned, the fourth grade. And uh, <clears throat> so then I got involved, uh, when I got back to Colorado, I got involved in what's called the Colorado Campaign Leadership Council. And I co-chair that, that group, which with the current uh, campaign going on here at the University of Michigan, we are a group of alumni that come together and put on events in the state of Colorado for potential donors uh, to the university. Um, when I wrapped up my uh, position on the College of Engineering Alumni Board, uh, Dan Inman invited me to be on the Industry Advisory Board as well. So and I've been serving on that board for two years now and uh, I've enjoyed my time uh, doing that. Um, for those of the students that recognize me and know me, I come back. I've been recruiting for Lockheed Martin since 97, other than the little four-year four stint I took away from Lockheed Martin. Again, when I came back to Lockheed Martin, it was day two, I said, I need to get back on the recruiting team at Michigan, and I got back on board, and I've been recruiting uh, for Lockheed Martin back here uh, again since I made it back to Lockheed Martin in 2007. So it was my way of saying, all right, thanks for, you know, for pulling this, you know, making me who I am today and, and some way to honor this department for its 100th anniversary. So hopefully that gives you a little insight to who I am. Um, I also wanted to mention that there, there are a couple other industry advisory boards members in here. John LaFon sitting in the back. Thank you, John, for all of your support throughout the years on the board. And Karen Albrecht, also an industry advisory board. And a special thank you for your recent gift to the university. I think that's outstanding. And uh, I'm sure the undergraduate students will appreciate it in the future. <laughs> Starting in the fall. All right. So, so again, I wanted to you know, give something back to the university. Um, and so. This flag really represents the first real treasure that I've given back to the university. You know, I mentioned all the time and talent that I've done giving, but this was really the first treasure that I could think of to give back to the university. And uh, so that's why I decided to fly the flag. Um, and hopefully it inspires other Michigan engineers to the possibilities and, and who knows, someday maybe one of you are putting that Michigan flag on whatever spacecraft it is. I don't care if it's Orion or Dragon, or whatever, and takes us and puts our boots on the surface of Mars and brings back a Michigan flag to be hung next to the Michigan flag that we're going to unveil tonight. So I'm looking forward to the day that happens. <clears throat> All right, so now I'm going to give you the journey of the flag. So sitting in the Industry Advisory Board, Sandro Seguro, are you out there in the crowd? Sandro is telling us all about the plans that the committee was doing to, for the 100th celebration in September. And they got me brainstorming, all right, I, there's something I need to do here that you know, can help honor uh, the university. And I, that's when I found out that the celebration was going to happen on September 18th, which was originally the flight date, our original launch campaign date for Orion. I'm like, well, I can't be here in Ann Arbor and at the Cape on the same day. I have to be at the Cape for this mission. And so I'm like, oh, if I, if I fly a Michigan flag and I Skype it back during the celebration, that would be something spectacular. But then our launch date slipped, and we slipped into December. I'm like, oh, well, now I can be at both places. I can go to the Aero 100 celebration, which, by the way, fantastic job by all involved in, in planning that uh, celebration. What a great day of few days of events and activities and parties and, and flyovers and everything that happened that weekend. It was out, outstanding um, for all of us who came back to be a part of that. And so I mentioned earlier, the, 
I think I mentioned earlier, the last time a Michigan flag flew in space was aboard Apollo 15, the all-Michigan crew of Apollo 15 that went to the moon, and they took flags with them. They took Michigan flags with them. And the folklore, for those who, when you first come to campus, right, and you're taking that campus tour, they tell you about there's two flags on the surface of the moon, the United States flag and the Michigan flag, and, you know, the, nobody's ever proven it. And when you talk to Al Warden, he doesn't admit it. But, you know, I think though that there's two flags that are framed, and there were three members on board that crew, so where's the third flag? Um, I don't know if I'm helping the folklore there, but... But anyway, I'm like, so the last time we sent a Michigan flag into deep space past the Van Allen belts was Apollo 15. I'm sure there have been Michigan things on board ISS. I've seen pictures of Go Blue stickers on ISS. But I'm like, all right, so we're going to fly this Michigan flag, and we're going to bring it back and give it to the department to honor its 100th anniversary. Um, so in the process of doing all this, I decided, well, it's not just me that, you know, this flag ought to represent. It ought to represent all of the Michigan engineers on the program. So then I started spreading it word of mouth amongst the alumni. And up until about January, um, I got, you know, my 75th alumni added to the list. And in fact, it was Peter Buning sent me an email and said, Corey, I've got another name. I can't believe we forgot this person. Can you please add her to the list? I'm like, well, I already sent a picture to the frame, framer, but yeah, why not? Let's do it. I'll just send the new picture, and then get it framed up. So we added our 75th in late January. I apologize if you, for those that see this in the future, if you've worked the program and we missed you, I uh, heartily apologize, heartfelt apology to you. Um, but uh, in the matter of the time we had to get this together, this is where I'm at today. And, uh, and so we had 75 of us get together, or 75 uh, come together so far. And uh, most of them have contributed to this in some way or another. And so I appreciate all their contributions and efforts, not only to the flag, but also uh, their contributions to Orion uh, over the years. Um, so this is just a couple of pictures that we had opportunities with. This one was done down in Houston. Uh, it was kind of a last minute thing. I had shipped the flag down to Houston to be packed up with all the other payloads. And uh, <clears throat> so we pulled this together last minute. This is not nearly half of the people down in Houston that are Michigan engineers that work the program. This is just the folks that can make it that morning when we set up the photo op. And then when we got the flag back in January, I got it back in Denver. I set up again another photo op. Uh, um, in our, our, in our CHILL, our Collaborative Human Immersive Laboratory. These three big uh, video monitors behind us uh, basically create a 3D cave for engineers to go work on their designs. And the manager of that lab is a Michigan engineer. And he was here, gave a talk in the fall, Aero 285, Darren Bolthouse. And so we all got together. And this is just half of, there's 11 of us of the 22 people in Denver that, work, that are Michigan engineers that work the program. Again, it was sort of last minute come together and take this picture. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so the rest of the journey of the flag. I'm, so I was, I decided, all right, I'm going to fly the flag. <clears throat> and uh, so I got to go get permission, right? I can't just put a flag on the crew module. I got to go to folks and get permission. So I start working with our program management team about flying this flag and uh, get their OK. And I had to explain to them. When they're like, well, if you do it, then everybody else is going to want to fly their flag. And how's that, you know, how's that going to work? And I said, no, you, got, you don't understand. This is the first, the oldest aerospace engineering department in the world. And they're celebrating their 100th anniversary on the same day we're supposed to launch. All right, well, maybe. I'm like, I'm like really? So I work, start working with the business development guy. Uh, Scott Norris is his name. And uh, a little hidden secret, Scott went to that school down south. <laughs> <laughs> and so he helped me navigate all the hoops in order to get the flag flown. And, uh, and so finally, I was on campus in April 2014 here for um, Vulcan's 110th anniversary. And I went to the M Den on State Street, and I went and bought a flag. And I'm like, well, four foot by six foot flag might be too big. It might be stretching it. <laughs> Little mini flag, I'm like, nah, it's too small. 
So I ended up with a boat size flag, 11 inches, uh, 11 inches by 16 inches. And I'm like, that's perfect. And then I contacted the department. I'm like, can you send me the, the logo for the Centennial? And I sent that off to an embroidery to, made into, to be made into a patch uh, that got sewn onto the flag. And I started getting all the mission patches and the company patches and an embroidery. And I took that to a company. They all get sewn on and embroidered. And the place I took it to was owned by a couple of Michiganders. <laughs> and they were all excited. And they're like, wow, this is awesome. Um, so then I got the flag back. It's all ready to go. I send it down to Houston to be packed up with what we call all the other ancillary payloads. And, uh, and the, the, the manager of those ancillary payloads, Joe LeBlanc, um, took great pains to make sure that all the items were well cared for. He took my flag, he, he folded it up, put it in a Ziploc bag that was then sealed. And all the items that, flo that were flown were sealed up to make sure that there were no outgassing issues. Um, and so he folded it all up, put it in a Ziploc bag, and put it with all the other things. And I'll tell you, when it was all said and done, I think there was about 7,000 items on board the spacecraft. Uh, most of those pens, pins, coins, things that will be handed out to uh, the engineers on the program to say thank you for the job well done and to give to congressmen to continue supporting us. <laughs> and and uh, But on that list, right, is a University of Michigan customized flag. Right below that is a T-Rex dinosaur tooth. <laughs> <laughs> so there were a bunch of unique items also flown, the Michigan flag being one of them. So got on board, sent it to Houston, got all packed up. They then shipped it to the Kennedy Space Center where it got put in board, on board uh, the crew module. Um, and then we landed off the, sh off the coast of the Baja California. We get uh, brought in by ship into the port of San Diego and then get put on a truck and the Michigan flag then made its way across the United States on a flatbed truck till it made it back to the Kennedy Space Center where then they took all that, those payloads out, sent them back to Houston and then Joe LeBlanc had to go through all those items and return them and I asked him, I said, I really want to present this as soon as possible to the university to be a part of the Aero 100 celebration so he made sure that I got my flag back quickly as possible, along with the flight certification letters. And, and, uh, and I got that back in January. And, uh, and then it was flown here to Ann Arbor to be framed up uh, in what you'll see in a little bit um, by Michaels uh, off of Washtenaw. Ryan Hinman there, if you ever need anything framed in, in you live here in Ann Arbor. He's a great guy, did an excellent job. Uh, and uh, so without further ado, Should I let the song continue? I don't hear anybody joining in. So, uh, so that's the flag right there, um, a picture of the flag that you'll see out, outside in the hallway in a minute. Uh, and so, like I said, two orbits around the Earth. It went 60,000 miles around the Earth at speeds of 20,000 miles per hour. Came, Orion came screaming back in, exceeding temperatures over 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and landed in the South Pacific Ocean. Uh, four and a half hours after takeoff. This letter I, I've written is, is my gift letter to the university and it's addressed to both Dean Munson and Chair Inman. And so it reads, on behalf of the 75 Michigan alumni from NASA, Lockheed Martin, United Launch Alliance, and our subcontractors, it is my great honor and privilege to present this customized Michigan flag to the University of Michigan. This flag was flown aboard Orion Exploration Flight Test 1 on December 5th, 2014, as the very first collegiate aerospace department in the world and in honor of its 100th anniversary, please accept this gift. This is the first Michigan flag to fly through the Van Allen belts since the all-Michigan Apollo 15 flight in July of 1971. Orion EFT-1 flew over 60,000 miles, reached an altitude of 3,600 statue miles, exceeded speeds of 20,000 miles per hour, 
and sustain temperatures in excess of 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit on reentry. This successful mission is the first major step in the nation's return to deep space human, human exploration and with planned travel to the moon, Mars, and other destinations. This flag is a tribute to Michigan Aerospace for its first 100 years, but we aspire to honor Michigan with many more flights to come. Our hope for the future of Michigan Aerospace is that we will continue to be the leaders and best by taking humans further than we've ever gone before. Go Orion and go blue. Go ahead. <laughs> and I did it in triplicate because I wanted a copy for my own sake, another copy for the department to keep, and then the third copy is going to go in the time capsule uh, to be opened up in 50 years. Which I'll open. Which you'll open? <laughs> Outstanding. Can you tell me where that fountain of youth is? And so. Also in here is attached the, the letter of flight cer certification where you can find the T-Rex dinosaur tooth and the University of Michigan <laughs> customized flag. And also a letter from our program manager uh, also uh, giving his approval of the, you, of the award. So. Okay. Thank okay, you. hard part's done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, now. So we're going to count down three. Right. With your help, like come on, right? Yeah. 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 So, in five, four, four three, three, two, one. There are many fuel feedstocks that are now entering both the transportation and the stationary sectors. So we hear a lot about the Canadian tar sand.